So I will start by asking you and tell you what a pleasure it is to be here with you. Um, Likewise. You have done, you have had a remarkable life and have done tremendous, um, s tremendous support against censorship on all levels and have defended um, many people that, uh, on many cases, that the majority of the people felt that it was unwinnable. So, um, can you tell me why? I mean, uh, tell me a little bit because I was very uh, surprised when I saw that you wanted to be an actor before you wanted to be a lawyer and that you felt that your father had, you know, tricked you into becoming a lawyer. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, uh, my father is a painter, not a decorator. And, um, uh, and uh, it's quite interesting because uh, he became increasingly concerned that I was uh, showing uh, and exhibiting signs of uh, interest in the music industry. Uh, which, as you know, is riven with drugs and groupies. Uh, and he thought that, uh, as an artist, that would be inappropriate for a son of his. Um, and uh, so I was uh, brought down to breakfast one day. Uh, the lodger that we had at the time was uh, the publisher of the music for the Pink Floyd. And uh, Peter, our lodger, said, uh, said to me, and I hadn't realised I was being set up at the time, he said, uh, Mark, you know, y I know you're interested in music, but people in the music industry don't make very much money. He said, uh, you should become a lawyer. That's where all the money's made. And of course, you know, this now coming from a man who lives in Holland Park in a multi-million pound mansion, where as opposed to myself, in, lives in relative poverty in the East End of London. Um, uh, so, yeah, I was tricked into becoming a, law a lawyer because he said he would give me all of the Pink Floyd's legal work, which didn't quite prove to be 100% true either. Um, but it, it did lead me to a more interesting space because once I actually rocked up as a lawyer I began an organization called Art Law about uh, giving free legal advice to artists and a lot of the questions that we got asked were about copyright obviously and infringement of copyright but also there was a, a really strong theme about artists who were doing challenging work challenging accepted notions and as a result of that um, one their freedom of expression was being curtailed. And I felt that this was wrong and that people should have a right to free expression. And it seemed to me that people were very often offended by the notion of something rather than uh, actually the work itself. Well, I see here that in 1987, um, I think perhaps that was your first case um, defending an artist who reproduced British banknotes in contravention of British law. I suppose that that was very difficult at the time. Yeah, I mean, this was a, an artist of no great note called uh, Boggs. No, no pun intended, I suppose. Um, uh, he was called JSG Boggs, and he, he uh, combined art with performance, and what he did was uh, he would paint uh, or draw uh, a, a bank note, a currency note, and then he would go to a store, for example, and buy a beer um, with a one pound note, because um, they still had them in those days, and uh, in return he would get uh, the change. Um, and nobody was under any misapprehension that this wasn't uh, anything other than a drawing, but what he was trying to do was to value the work. And so what his collectors do is go and they try and collect the beer, uh, or the beer can if he's drunk it, uh, the change, and the artwork itself. And they co collect them together as a sort of documentation of this kind of performance piece. And uh, the rather humorless people at uh, uh, the Bank of England um, <laughs> didn't, uh, didn't really appreciate, uh, I mean, I think they were visually illiterate, um, <laughs> but uh, they were... <laughs> They couldn't understand why this was uh, um, a pro They couldn't understand why this was an artwork and not a problem, and so they, they took it so seriously. They took him to the Old Bailey, and there we were in court number one at the Old Bailey, where you know murderers, terrorists, and rapists are, are, are tried day in day out, and now we've got an artist on trial. And um, the works that they picked were his oil paintings, which were 
basically sort of two meters by this size. And uh, I tried the, to begin with, I, I, tried, I thought I'd try a practical line with the judge. And uh, I said, you know, nobody is going to uh, say that something on canvas uh, on one side with a stretcher um, is going to be confused with the, between this and a real currency note. Uh, and in a rather racist way that only the British justice system can produce a judge, he said, uh, well, someone getting off an, an aeroplane from the Indian subcontinent might. Um, so <laughs> we were into a real trial and we had a bit of an uphill battle from there. Um, and in the end, I decided that we would just poke fun at this, this case. And eventually the jury came round and said, look, you know, clearly this is stupid and, uh, and gave him a not guilty verdict. But it, it was a really interesting... It was, a, it was one of the first forms of censorship that we saw in, in that. It was, a, it was a, a, an interesting uh, case. And, you know, uh, he now, he's, he's been drawing currency notes for, you know, Swiss currency, nobody's ever prosecuted him, Australian currency, nobody's ever prosecuted him, US dollar bills. But there was a sort of postscript to the case, which is that um, one of the things they wanted to prosecute him for was breach of copyright, which was the copyright in the British currency notes. Unfortunately, the copyright was out of date. It had run out. Um, it had expired. And so that is the reason that we had uh, all the currency notes redone. And if you open up your wallets and take out a currency note, you will now see a copyright byline on the bottom of the, of, of the note uh, which says C in a circle, I think it says either Bank of England or something like that, uh, and then a, a year. And that's the copyright byline, which was never in the original notes. And, and so if you've got very old notes at home, you know, from uh, pre this sort of round, uh, the old-fashioned one-pound notes, for example, uh, you will see that they didn't have this copyright byline. So you made history with that case. <laughs> What is interesting is that the Gazette said about you, the patron, you are the patron solicitor, solicitor of previously lost causes. Well, we know that he's certainly not um, of lost causes because he wins them. <laughs> but, so we, I'm sure that I, as much as the audience, would like to know, how do you win those very difficult cases, particularly cases when it comes to issues relating to very difficult cases on, on the issue of censorship and art and, you know, where the issue of morality is involved. Well, I mean, I think that there is this collision, isn't there, between what we see in our cultural institutions and what we experience in our cultural institutions and what, if it was um, produced by often a you know, another person or it was used in, in, in commonal uh, use, we might think of um, as being illegal. And there are a whole raft of issues. I mean, in, in societies, all different countries believe in different things sen being censored. And we all believe that some things should be censored. And the question really is an argument about where do you draw the line? And, you know, in uh, with Judeo-Christian values in Northwest Europe, we're pretty sensitive in this country about sexually related matters. And so you see things that around uh, sex and violence tend to be uh, problematic, particularly performance art. Um, but if you go to, oh, I don't know, say Korea, for example, um, it is illegal to, um, criminally illegal, uh, to depict uh, a thing called the Kwangju incident, which is uh, about uh, the massacre of uh, a load of civilians. And so you get different societies reacting in different ways to try and defend themselves from criticism and uh, that kind of thing. So I've always tried to allow artists and uh, cultural institutions the space to document artists' work. I mean, artists react to the environment in which they live, and in many ways we treat our cultural institutions as a place where, you know, in the Victorian era, you would never have been allowed to see naked breasts um, except in a cultural institution. So we clearly have a different set of values which we 
uh, apply to them, and the law actually recognises that. And so, as a result, I think we need to argue them. Do you think, you know how we have an evolving standards of, of human right, mm. you know, which the Supreme Court in America has to deal with and has dealt with. Do you think we have an evolving standards of the criterion that we apply to what is permissible or not permissible in art? And therefore, how do artists need to um, react to that? And you, as a solicitor who represents as artists, how do you deal with it? Well, I mean, I think you see, you see it. I mean, you, you just partly artists will document and react to the particular time and society in which they are living and working. And I mean, you can just plot it over the lifetime of an artist. You take Lucian Freud, who started off um, doing some fairly innocuous images, but were quite challenging in the early 60s, uh, through to, you know, fairly detailed portraits of people's perineum. Um, and it does seem to me that there are those works have become more explicit over a period of time. And partly, we don't react badly to them because we recognize the value of the work of art, but also um, the standard in society of what we tolerate um, is, has, has changed. Um, so I think, you know, you have to look at that. And we have a number of defense mechanisms as a society. So, you know, you can have indecent displays, you can have, uh, which is kind of self-evident, you can have uh, outraging public decency, which is sort of like a common law offense, uh, uh, or you can have something which me, me, might transgress the Obscene Publications Act. But the Obscene Publications Act is really a very, very... Uh, can, you tell the, can you tell us what is the Obscene Publications Act so that people understand? Yeah, I mean, the Obscene Publications Act was really intended to um, target uh, pornographers um, and, you know, is a piece of legislation from 59. And so it's quite aged. Um, and what it does is it says that, you know, if you're going to fundamentally subvert the values of society, you're going to create um, some societal, societal wrong, uh, it goes beyond making people discomforted or shocked or, uh, or offended. It goes way you know, a piece of legislation from 59. And so it's quite aged. Um, and what it does is it says that, you know, if you're going to fundamentally subvert the values of society, you're going to create um, some societal, societal wrong uh, it goes beyond making people discomforted or shocked or, uh, or offended. It goes way beyond that. It's got to be some permanent lasting damage to a sizable chunk of people who might see it. Then in those circumstances, uh, you can be found guilty of this criminal offence. Now, that's why when you go into um, uh, you know, an exhibition such as the... Um, uh, the uh, rather tame exhibition, I thought, of uh, uh, work at the Royal Academy a while ago where they had people like Jake and Dinos Chapman and the rest of it. But there were little rooms which were 18 only um, because that was where the very rude stuff was put. Um, and, the, uh, uh, and so what you're saying is that the likely audience is A, people who are interested in art, and B, over 18, so the chances of depraving and corrupting people uh, are fairly limited because uh, I would suggest that people who go to cultural institutions have a fairly strong constitution and are not easily offended. Whereas, you know, if you put it, you know, in a, a church on a Sunday uh, in Middle England, you might find that people were more readily offended. Now, I remember that you represented Maplethorpe. Mm. Well, I uh, advised institutions showing his work, yeah. You advised? Yeah. It was not representing because there was a case. But tell me how do we deal. I, I, I do remember taking my daughter when she was little to see a Maplethorpe show. And there were some images that were quite disturbing for, for a little child. You know, and uh, so I didn't know how to, I didn't know what to do except just simply to have to leave the exhibition. 
Um, how do we deal with that? And what is the right um, attitude that um, museums and galleries need to take? And, and what is your position vis-a-vis -vis of that? And you were talking about the over 18. Hmm. I mean, I, I take the view that if you inform members of the public, um, you know, you don't have to put it in an over 18 room. You can say, don't go into this room uh, if you're easily offended, for example. Um, and I remember a similar incident to you. Um, I took my daughter uh, when she was, I don't know, sort of 9, 10, something, you like know, that. this chap in a film who's sort of got rather large willy and he's kind of dancing around and it's just jangling about. Um, uh, <laughs> In a way which she was, she was incredibly curious to, 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 to view. Uh, and I kind of felt, well, she's asked about this. She's obviously heard about it. So I don't want to make it something which is sort of, you mustn't see this, it'll, you know. And I just thought, this is nothing she hasn't seen at home, perhaps slightly smaller scale. Uh, um, and uh, so we took her in to, to see this. And uh, she, she, she stood there for a bit and realised that there wasn't much more happening than it, this thing's jangling about. And she went, oh, should we go then? And, and I thought, well, that's kind of got the reaction I want. And, but she saw it, and it wasn't a problem. But, I mean, going back to Mapplethorpe, um, you know, there are some more hardcore images in, in, in his work. And I think that, again, if you inform the public who's going, then they can, they can make a decision. And, you know, uh, I mean, even if you look at, if you, if you look at uh, the book, which documents his work, the, uh, the rude pictures are between two... Um, leaves, one which are, are red, I think, or to illustrate that you know it's kind of portraits there at the front, and it's kind of um, still lives at the back, and you've got um, homoerotic in the middle, uh, including um, Mr. Mark Stevens' ten and a half inches, um, which was uh, an image that uh, my wife first saw at the Hay Haywood, and. Uh, uh, she said, well, where have you been hiding that? Um, which <laughs> I thought was... Uh, but, you know, those were images which, um, you know, if you transport yourself back to the values which we, we were talking about a moment ago, uh, to the, you know, 60s, could not have been shown. You couldn't have shown male genitalia. You certainly couldn't have shown male genitalia in bondage, and you certainly couldn't have shown, you know, a whip coming out of someone's bottom. So there's a, there's a whole raft of images which you can deal with, um, and you can sh show them, but uh, I would say that we we went through a sort of a period of liberation around, you know, sort of the swinging 60s and the permissive 70s uh, and that sort of period. And then I think, yes, the 80s too. And I, But I think what we've got now is kind of a, a swing back uh, to a more prudish um, period, a sort of more Daily Mail valued uh, set of images um, where double you know, standards. Yeah, well, I think it Daily is double mail. standards. I mean, you know, you take, uh, and I mean, this is, I find really troubling. I mean, is that you know, you've got collections in our cultural institutions which document art practice from the sixties through the seventies, eighties, and, and before and after. But you know, let's take an image like uh, Richard Prince's photograph of uh, uh, a prepubescent Brooke Shields in a bubble broth, slightly oiled up. I mean, an image which has got incredibly wide circulation, um, and you have a situation where, you know, the Baltic reports itself to the local constabulary um, uh, because it's concerned about exhibiting the image. You get a situation where the Tate takes it down um, and replaces it with a, an adult version of, of, of that image, uh, Spirit of America. And I think, you know, what we have got to avoid is judging by today's values and projecting today's values on work and art practice from a previous era. And I think, you know, clearly people are very worried about paedophilia and, you know, child abuse and all of those things, and rightly so. But, you know, there are artists who document... Uh, have documented this up until now. Um, their work is widely available. So why on earth would we try and prosecute those people? I mean, uh, there was an attempt to censor 
Sally Mann's work, the American photographer who documented pictures of her children, often naked, because that's the way they played. I mean, they live in the the Virginia countryside, miles from anywhere on an estate, and, you know, there's a river running through the property, and they quite often go down and jump in, and they just take their clothes off and get, get in. And so she captures them in those rather wonderful moments of innocence and all the rest of it. And what you've got are adult values being projected onto these images to make them dirty and smutty when in fact they're nothing of the kind and I think you know we have got to be able to see images um, without those kind of preconceived notions being projected onto them. Do you feel that um, censorship, that we, that our society, that we are threatened by censorship, not only on art, you know, on the, on the world, of, in the world of art, but as a whole, you know, when we talk about the internet and um, um, and what we are living today, are we really threatened by censorship overall? And you know, you you see the cases of of Julian Assange. You see the case the case of Ai Weiwei, of artists, of of journalists. What do you think about all of that? And how can we deal with it? Well, I mean, I think that. There are a number of different issues there, just unpackaging them one at a time. First of all, we're seeing increasing, um, increasingly aggressive approach by the police, often prompted, I think, by members of the public, sometimes prompted. I mean, I uh, advised and assisted the Saatchi Gallery um, over its Nan Golden and Tierney Giron shows, where... Um, the show had been up for something like six weeks. No member of the public had complained, um, but the News of the World heard about the show and decided that uh, it would um, uh, nip along to the local police station to file a complaint because, you know, then you get a story. It saves you hacking, doesn't it, for the weekend? Um, uh, but uh, so you, you, you've got this sort of increase in uh, criminalisation and, you know, you know, police in hobnail boots tromping through our cultural institutions, which cannot be a good state of affairs. And then, you know, you go to people like Ai Weiwei, who are producing work which is politically challenging, whether it's, you know, um, security cameras or whether it's uh, uh, his film work documenting corruption uh, amongst minor officials in China, which has resulted in not a direct form of censorship... Um, but an indirect form of censorship, but results in the same thing, where you know they make they accuse him of um, uh, not filing his tax return or not paying his tax, and so you 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 criminalise somebody by by saying oh you're a tax avoider, when in fact actually your idea is you want to lock him up, you want to isolate him, and so they impose restrictions on Ai Weiwei, which say. You can't. You're under house arrest. You can't talk to foreigners, uh, and you can't uh, ship work. And you, you know, uh, you, you're not allowed to leave your home and studio. So it becomes an increasingly difficult environment within which to work. Um, so you see that form of censorship, and then you see kind of economic censorship. So I mean, you see, you saw that perhaps most vividly with Andres Serrano's. Um, uh, Piss Christ image, where the uh, National Endowment for the Arts in America took away the funding from and, and, and threatened to take away the funding from any institution which showed or exhibited the work, um, because it's run by, you know, politically uh, or po politicians who are susceptible to the whims of their um, Midwestern, you know, uh, Christian electorates. Uh, and so that creates a problem, and and so you know, but we've seen it equally with you know um, uh, Lacoste removing sponsorship because it didn't like uh, the the work that's being produced. And these challenges, which in particularly in an environment where government has now removed itself from uh, supporting the arts and doc documenting the arts, means that we're increasingly reliant on. Uh, old-fashioned forms of philanthropy and sponsorship in order to make things work. Um, and so that form of economic censorship um, is going to become, I think, more pertinent. And, you know, uh, and you raised it with Julian Assange, and Julian Assange was 
also uh, as a writer, uh, subject to a different form of economic censorship through MasterCard and Visa. I mean, they're not quite the same, but I think there's a, certainly a parallel. And perhaps not many people in this room know that you are chairman of the governors at the um, Union of at the University of East London. Can you tell us how how come you are, and how do you combine your position as a as a solicitor? a very successful solicitor with this work? Well, uh, I, I thought that the University of East London uh, was an important university. Oxbridge and Red Brick Universities in this country get an awful lot of support. Um, they're universities which uh, families and young students uh, aspire to go to. Um, the new universities, and University of East London is one of them, are more access universities, therefore people who cannot afford to leave home and have to live in the neighbourhood. Um, and so, you know, if you go to the University of East London, you are likely to live within five miles of the university. And it's usually you're the first person in your family to go to university. And I felt it was important to provide a very rounded approach to that. And one of the things that we've done uh, is to work uh, to develop a very strong arts and cultural department and so you know we have people like Gilbert and George who come in Grayson Perry has been in um, we uh, Grayson used to be a lecturer there um, uh, the one of the, uh, uh, the two sorry about brain thing the two brothers um, has uh, Chapman brothers. yeah Chapman brothers that used to be there as a student um, you know, it's it's heavily supported by Gavin Turk, who donates a work each year to allow the artists, uh, the art students, to put on their their show. And so it's 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 artists from the community in the East End. It's very much supported by them, and it's uh, it gives them an opportunity to move forward. And one of the things that the, the strong themes that I uh, have wanted us to to lead on is female entrepreneurship and female empowerment. And if you think about the demographic of you know, East London, um, giving women an opportunity to grow their own businesses uh, and to uh, develop themselves allows them to perhaps move away from uh, a rather paternalistic culture and maybe a slightly oppressive culture. It allows them the opportunity to develop independently and that was part and parcel it's, if you like it's quite subversive but you know I think it's about presenting opportunities in a different way to presenting opportunities for you know um, people who just don't have a lot of money. Now you talked about female I know you are, feel very strongly about female mutilation tell me about <coughs> your concerns and about what you have done in that respect. I was pretty horrified to learn that there had been uh, um, a lot of female genital mutilation in the East End of London. It is more prevalent in Tower Hamlets and Newham than anywhere else in Western Europe. And I discovered that, um, uh, because a doctor told me that they had come across it and uh, were aware of it, but we're not reporting it to police or social workers. And when I asked why, I said, they said, because they do nothing about it, because they don't want to cause uh, a dispute with the local community. Um, and I just felt that that was fundamentally wrong because it was uh, mutilating somebody uh, as a child who can do nothing about it. Uh, and I felt that we had a duty to uh, begin uh, to protect people and so have uh, started to work with um, lawyers who will take action against anyone that, uh, particularly the doctors, uh, who will perform these operations, in inverted commas, uh, uh, because I think that if the doctors stop it, then hopefully the practice will stop too. And I want to let you know that, that Mark is on Twitter, at Mark. Mark's Larks. Larks. And that I am on Twitter, at Bianca Jagger, and that I have promised him that I will take on 
with the Bianca Jag Human Rights Foundation um, this issue. And so I hope that you will all support us in denouncing uh, female genital mutilation, not only in this country, but throughout the world. Uh, going, what, going back um, uh, to the, uh, the subject of, of censorship, do you think that there is a difference between the work of relatively unknown artists and highly respected artists? And do you think that, for example, what is allowed to somebody like Lucian Freud wouldn't be allowed to some unknown young <coughs> artist that is coming out? I think that uh, I think it's got to be right, hasn't it? I mean, uh, there are images which are challenging, um, but I think people are more likely to get. Uh, attention if they are um, less well known because they are not represented in public collections by and large and therefore you haven't got a cultural institution standing behind your work um, so that's at the sort of lower end of the scale but if you go to the you know upper middle end of the scale you've got people like uh, Sally Mann that I mentioned you know she's highly respected highly collected uh, throughout the world, uh, her professional practice is well documented, um, yet the police still want to have a, a go at her, whereas Lucian Freud, who you know paints pictures of his children naked, uh, or did paint pictures of his children naked and others, um, have um, effectively immunity. And I think that it's probably because the prosecutors are not prepared to take on the art establishment at the at the highest end. Um, I would venture to suggest that even a policeman has heard of Lucien Freud, whereas most policemen will not have heard of uh, of um, you know someone like Sally Mann. Interestingly, I mean, I had a, a case involving um, Jeff Koons and his Made in Heaven series. You remember the uh, images of him and La Cicciolina uh, engaged engaged in sexual practices. Um, and the uh, Christie's were looking to sell uh, an image of La Cicciolina with, an, with her arm up a gentleman's bottom and uh, the constabulary came in from Scotland Yard uh, and uh, were concerned about this image and uh, I managed to persuade them that there was not a problem with it partly because of its uh, wide circulation but also that it was obviously consensual and the policeman said to me how do you know that this is consensual? And I said, just look at the smile on that chap's face. Um, uh, and that seemed to resolve it for the policeman. Uh, and they went away. And the work was uh, sold. I mean, it, we did put uh, a little sort of uh, folding page which said, you know, over 18, do only, only open this uh, if, it, if, it's not, uh, if you're not easily offended. Um, but, you know, of course, the, the problem with that is it's, it, it creates interest, doesn't it? I mean, you get that. Um, I mean, we had a, a case years ago when the Ferrens Gallery in, Scotland, uh, in, 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 in Hull uh, had an exhibition of feminist painters, including Sue, Sue Coe and Jackie Morrow and people like that, the sort of emerging feminist artists. And uh, the local authority... Um, wanted to withdraw um, uh, some of the images because they had uh, erect male penises from the, in them and uh, that created a, a local fuss and eventually <coughs> they backed down because I said I would sue them uh, for interfering and um, of course it got documented in the local paper and they had a more footfall at that exhibition than anything else because you've got the controversy around it. Uh, and, and to some extent, that's probably a good thing because although people are going probably to see what the fuss was about, you are exposing them to uh, works of art and culture and perhaps engaging, you know, and it gives the, the cultural institution an opportunity to engage with people um, in relation to, 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 to the works that they, they're seeing. You are probably a solicitor that will sense, um, will make your opponents very frightened to be fighting against you. But at the same time, what I was very interesting to see is that you are promoting mediate disputes. 
mediating a dispute. Me mediating disputes. Yeah. So tell us a little a bit about that because well, I, I think that's that, an interesting aspect of your work. Yeah, I mean, I think that what we're trying to do is to avoid. Uh, and how you go about? How you achieve that? It, it, I think we try and go avoid litigation where possible and I think you know one of the best things that we achieve is where you don't actually have to go to the old Bailey to defend somebody uh, I mean I have been and I will go and I will defend the artist if necessary but um, there are I think history has shown, has taught me that you are much better off um, trying to help and work with the gallery um, and the people who work in, in, in the gallery uh, to avoid um, the uh, dispute come, become, going legal. And very often, just very sensible things like explaining to the invigilating staff at the gallery why this work is on display, what is the, what is the art, art historical context of it, um, what happens if you've got provocative work or challenging work, you know, who should be, what's the referral up mechanism, you know, do you, you get the, the invigilators to send somebody to the front desk and then the front desk knows that they should be calling, um, you know, a senior curator down who can have a conversation. It's quite often people, even if they've got, they've got the warnings and they've gone in and they've become offended, if you can talk it through with them, the fact that you've listened to them and you've heard them out is often enough. It's only if you're rude and you're high-handed and you say, I'm, you know, I know about culture and you don't, and that kind of approach to things that I think, uh, or there's no obvious way for people to actually engage with the gallery on this issue, then in those circumstances, uh, I think that they, they feel that their only response is to go to a police station. And so it is easier, I think, to try and have a dialogue and you may have you know conclude politely that there is an uh, you know honestly held difference of opinion um, and you perhaps invite them back to something which is less controversial but that's a very sensible way and you know on a number of occasions we've actually prepared FAQs for um, members of staff so that if they engage members of the public they know what the party line is in relation to the exhibition and the work and because we all know that within a larger institution, very often, we don't get these, um, that that information doesn't always filter down to the very lowest levels within the organisation, or if it does, it does so patchily uh, and unevenly. And I think it's important that everybody has a clear understanding. Do you think that, in your view, that there are limits to artistic freedom of expression? I think there probably are limits. I'm not sure that I've yet explored any of them. Um, uh, actually, that's not true. I, I did discover, um, I did discover a work which uh, shocked you. No, it didn't shock me. Actually, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty unshockable. But the, uh, <laughs> um, I think, partly because I don't judge uh, in that kind of way. Um, but I could see that there were things which crossed um, certain rubicans within society that people would go beyond feeling shocked uh, being offended I could see that people would feel you know uh, more than a sense of revulsion and as a result of that I felt it was important that you know although the work was reacting it was very challenging work uh, I did feel that it was uh, it was it was an issue which perhaps needed uh, more careful consideration I know that you recently spoke, I don't know if it was in Cambridge or in Oxford, about homosexual consensual relationships in private. Could you tell us a little bit of what have you been doing in regards to that? Sure. To that? Uh, maybe we should go out to the audience in a minute. But I think yeah. the one, one of the things that's really interested me at the moment is, um, and I'm really concerned about, is that 193 countries of the world do not criminalise consenting male homosexual activity in private um, and if you go to look at the commonwealths of Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, Belgium, Holland, none of them criminalise. Uh, the only areas of, uh, in fact the Soviet 
uh, Chinese and Japanese empires never uh, criminalized either. And so you're left with a very small rump of countries, mainly British Commonwealth countries, and you know we have, of course, decriminalized in this country, as have Canada and South Africa and Australia and New Zealand. But there are places which are really very worrying. I mean, four countries on the planet still have the death sentence for it, which I think is just outrageous. Um, you know, uh, the Maldives, uh, it is not only a criminal offence, but you also get between 10 and 30 lashes of a whipping if uh, and a period of imprisonment as the sentence. And I just felt that this was inappropriate. And so we've started a series of legal challenges around the world. Uh, the first one will be in Belize. Um, and then they'll likely to be, the next one will be in J Jamaica, uh, to actually challenge whether or not um, those laws are legitimate in terms of international law. And I think most people feel that, most right-thinking people feel that they shouldn't be. But there is this kind of um, approach within some of those countries, often provoked by, I think, misguided uh, churches and religions, um, which uh, have provoked and or advocated uh, criminalization. I mean, it's a real challenge. I mean, if you look at Indonesia, for example, most populous Muslim nation on the planet, it's not criminal because they have Dutch law. And so, you know, why are we putting up with, you know, frankly, mainly African states and Caribbean states which do still criminalize it? And so that's uh, an area outside my art practice where I'm, I'm engaged heavily at the moment on human rights challenges because I think it is an important uh, area. And if anybody's interested in that work, uh, it's documented at a, a website uh, on an organization called the Human Dignity Trust. Well, I think that, thank you very much, Mark, for this extraordinary um, access that you gave us to answer all of these questions. I know that people would like to ask you answer, but I think that we should give him a round of applause. For <laughs> And maybe we could get a microphone to give to the audience. No, I wanted to. Uh, just a nod to the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, I've never seen so many nudes. I think that pretty much everyone is nude. But I think uh, Freud's a great ambassador for the nude. Because if you really think about it, he's, he's not painting new people, he's painting people who happen to have no clothes on. And there's a big difference there, and the, the attention to detail is so respectful. I, I found it a complete, not only not erotic, but actually a wonderful celebratory occasion of the ordinariness of people and how they present. And don't forget it's on. <laughs> and your question? Well, no, no. I, th I mean, it's interesting. My reaction to that is interesting because I... Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, my father uh, uh, is a painter, and when I was growing up, I grew up with naked ladies wandering around the house because uh, his studio was in one of the rooms in the house, and you know we would come home from school, and as sort of pubescents, uh, we would uh, encounter uh, his life models wandering in and around, uh, which made my house the most popular place for the first stop after school. <laughs> At least with some of my colleagues. Can you hold it up a bit closer? Yes. Thank you. I mean, I think that's a really interesting and pertinent question. I think one of the, I, I do think the medium plays a big difference. And I think, you know, uh, also the amount of re realism. I mean, you know, you've got people who can paint in sort of almost photographic realism. 
uh, and they sort of probably form the next rung down the scale or across the scale is that without wishing to put a uh, one way or the other um, and then you get into fine art photography which a lot of lay observers confuse with just straightforward photography and so they look at what they've seen in a pornographic magazine or um, and then look at the images and think well that's that's about as rude as that so that must be illegal and then they look at film work and then they look at what they've seen in pornographic films and project values onto the artwork at that point and then I think that at the other end of the scale uh, or the other side of the scale is um, performance work which I think very often people find very disturbing both in terms of the actual performance of it but also often in terms of the um, if it's recorded on, on, on DVD or something and so they find that more difficult and I think when you have people who are not um, as attuned to um, fine art work in, in, in the video uh, or moving images and as well as still photographs and performance, I think you find that um, policemen find very great difficulty uh, in, and members of the public uh, find great difficulty in making those differentiations. And part of what we have to do is to assist that process if we assist the process in making people understand and decode the images that they are seeing, it, it, then in those ways, they, that, that way they'll understand it and they're li less likely to be offended because it's not something that they should be offended by um, because they're understanding the work that what they're, that they're dealing with. I mean, um, one of the cases I know Bianca uh, was interested in when we were talking uh, was a case I defended at the Old Bailey about uh, a sculptor called Rick Gibson who took two freeze-dried fetuses um, and put them on a mannequin under glass um, and it was a work which was about um, abortion and all of the, the way in which people rather wear their abortions like it was a fairly direct piece but it was subject to a prosecution for outraging public decency um, because people just focused on the freeze-dried fetuses. You know, so that was, you know, I think, a, an example of an area where the law has sort of shaded into areas of difficulty. But I, I do agree. I think the medium is a problem, and I think that's the reason it's a problem. Bill McAllister, I, I, I wanted first to confirm what you said about Mapplethorpe when we showed it first here at the ICA. Maybe it was your advice at the time. We had a separate room for certain of the pictures, and under 18 year olds weren't allowed in. And we had no complaints from the public, it passed smoothly. Although I did see a police report later saying, leave it alone while it's at the ICA, but if these are shown anywhere else in London, we'd better have another look. <laughs>
They like their fee in advance. <laughs> it must be a case. I mean, the, the small arts organizations find it difficult to uh, afford you. Well, I, I think... The least, the least interesting question, but... Well, I think that on the Robin Hood level, I think my partners think I play Robin Hood far too regularly. Um, uh, but I think that the reality is that, uh, I mean, I, I wasn't involved in the uh, Mapplethorpe when it was here. Um, but, you know, interestingly, uh, they went to the Whitechapel and then Hay Haywood and, you know, it became almost impossible to stop it after that. And then the books came out. And nobody ever bothered to prosecute that because of who Mapplethorpe was, I think. Um, but... I think that your point, which I think is perhaps the most pernicious form of censorship, is the kind of old school, smoke-filled room, leaning on uh, somebody and saying, you know, you do this, you behave appropriately, or, and, you know, it's or we're going to prosecute you, or we're going to cut off your funding, or we're going to create some other kind of you know, reputational stink around you or the organisation, all of which is really quite unpleasant and unfortunate. And at one level, you've got to be able to say, well, people who donate money to support an organisation should have a right to withdraw that money. I mean, you as the organisation should have the right to show or not to show, but they have a right to pay for that or not. But economic censorship has become so... or the economics of the art world have become so reliant on support from philanthropists and sponsors that I think we have to find a way of allowing our organizations our cultural institutions to stand free of that particularly with this new policy um, and so as a result of that I think you know it's important for lawyers to come in and quite often the way in which we work in partnership with cultural institutions uh, not all of which we charge or charge the full rate, is that we say to them, there's nothing illegal here. And that sticks and resolve and stiffens the backbone of the uh, trustees, who are usually the wimpy bit, um, because they're usually the great and the good, and they feel that their reputations might be a problem. So once you've got a, an independent lawyer saying, there's no problem, then actually they become much more tough and stand behind the institution is my experience. But sometimes there is a problem but you still want to confront it. You know you might lose but you feel it's a battle worth fighting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, and that, those circumstances, you know, that comes down to priorities that you have to make, you know, is the institution going to stand up for the censorship? Will it start a fighting fund which will, will allow, it? can it find a lawyer which will act as act pro bono? I mean, here you've got Sir Ken MacDonald or Lord Ken Macdonald on the on the board, um, you know, most eminent QC and former director of public prosecutions. If he was to defend an obscenity case here at the ICA, it'd be difficult for the pro the current public director of public prosecutions to to bring a case. So you know, you've you've built your defence in from the board level up, and well done you. <laughs> there was a lady here. But for me, it's, um, it's, it's, for me, it's self-defining by the artist. It's what the artist intended by the work. If, he, if the artist says it's an artwork, it is an artwork, and I will defend it on that basis. Simple as that. Um, I accept that there are images and uh, areas where it is challenging for some viewers and will shock and disturb some viewers. But in a pluralistic society, um, we tolerate the fact that we walk into a cultural location and we will be shocked, we will be offended, we will be disturbed. That's all part and parcel of embracing uh, a cultural institution and the work that it's exhibiting. 
um, if you like, society has defined cultural institutions as being those places where kind of we can let off steam. It's the escape valve. You know, if you're going to put that same self same material in, you know, a book in Waterstones or uh, Daunts or something, then it may be very, very different. And, you know, I've had a whole series of cases for Tashin in relation to their art books, um, in relation to what they've, what they've put out, which have often been misread uh, or misunderstood by um, people who've gone in and come across them inadvertently. Well, I'm not judgmental about it, and if you know, if a, if an artist says to me, "This is the, this is an artwork," it's an artwork, um, because I think only art, only an artist can define whether or not their work is an art. Is art? Thank you. Thank you. Um, such a template might defend themselves with, with when confronted with the fact that they display images that um, might be described as. Yeah, I think actually newspapers always say we have family values, even Sun and the Daily Sport. Um, uh, you know, uh, you almost read my mind because uh, about a week ago I put out, a, uh, five days ago I put out a tweet uh, saying how wonderful it is that uh, um, Rupert Murdoch is going to bring us page three to a Sunday, our Sunday breakfast table, um, you know, and so, you know, there is clearly this this difference. But uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, newspapers would say they would say, particularly people like the Mail, they would say we are de defenders of um, uh, family values, and as defenders of fa family values, uh, we condemn. And so it's easier for them to whip up and condemn people in the art world um, and to make something of a story where there is nothing. But it's very difficult to, it then becomes difficult and expensive for the cultural institution to defend itself because public views have been formed. Um, I'm afraid uh, uh, the question I think is, you know, how do you define the difference between pornography and art, or should art not be tempered? Uh, and I, I, I'm afraid I look at things very non-judgmentally. Uh, indeed, whether they're what one would contemporaneously call pornography or not, uh, you know, I am of the view that there is, in the sort of televisual terms, an off switch. If you don't want to encounter things which might be uh, challenging, uh, if you're easily shocked or offended, then don't go and see something which is going to likely shock or offend you. Uh, and it's pretty easy, uh, provided the cultural institution is making sure that people are told and at the, at the front entrance there are notices. And, you know, we have to recognise, I think, that there are a range of views from very tolerant to quite intolerant, and there will be people at all points on that range. But what we have to do is to protect the rights of those that are very tolerant to be able to engage with that which they see as uh, uh, important and challenging, because that's what artists do. They engage with challenging issues of their time. Well, it, it has been a great pleasure and we thank Mark for giving us this important time. 
and uh, thank you very much.